I only see about five patients with bronchiectasis a month. My area of concentration is primarily severe asthma and then uh, COPD. But because we know at least a third of people with asthma have bronchiectasis and don't know it, and also up to 35% of people with COPD have bronchiectasis and don't know it, I always look for it because it's not uncommon, which, which is what a lot of my colleagues think it is. You know, you can't find trouble unless you look for it. And this is all in the quest to really inform the patient about what they can do to help themselves stay healthy longer. Safety never happens by accident. So I think we all need to have a greater awareness about the dangers of bronchiectasis. And uh, this is why education is so important, not only for the clinician, but for the patients and their family members. The vests that are currently available, they're clearly uh, indicated for people who have bronchiectasis. But bronchiectasis very often is an end stage result of an ulcerative bronchitis. So it makes sense to diagnose you know, bronchitis earlier and to do everything we can to protect the patient. It's like treating pneumonia early, diagnosing cancer early and cutting it out. I, I think right now where we are in clinical practice is that we wait too long as clinicians to help patients. And patients don't know when the right time is. So we have to redouble our efforts, not to educate the patient, but to do what we need to do to identify patients who need it, which is why, you know, if you look at the very nonspecific symptoms of cough, sputum production, and shortness of breath, they always think of bronchiectasis. And so uh, at the university, what I do, I talk to my colleagues when I teach them, I tell them to remember the ABCs. Think of asthma, think of bronchiectasis, and think of COPD, always in every patient. I always look for people with an ineffective cough. If they constantly clear their throat, then maybe they need a little bit of help. But what we very often have are older patients who have chronic diseases, and many of them have been on uh, prednisone for exacerbation, and prednisone has a lot of effects on the body, and we forget how much it can affect the cough mechanism. And so if somebody has a chronic cough, I always uh, obtain a chest CT scan, and if they have bronchiectasis, I will recommend right off um, a smart vest. Uh, I, I can try these handheld PEP devices, but I've learned through experience that going straight to high frequency chest wall oscillation is the much better practice. It, 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 it doesn't waste any of the patient's time. Now, when I talk to my colleagues about uh, bronchiectasis, I tell them it's an ulcerative bronchitis. The airway is destroyed and it is basically a reservoir for uh, microbes to grow in, be it bacteria or fungus. And it'll continue to grow unless you basically remove it, which is why it's so important to have an effective cough. But for those patients who truly have bronchiectasis, they need additional help because uh, the, the mucus becomes very tenacious with a uh, combination of white blood cells. These white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, they release these extracellular traps, which is their DNA, and that just increases the viscosity of the phlegm. And these white blood cells, they oxidize these uh, uh, hydrogels, which we call phlegm, and they cause a linkage to take place, which makes the plugs um, develop in the airways. And I, I, I learned by making uh, mistakes and learning from my mistakes, and I've found 
that my patients get the best result uh, when we go very quickly to high frequency chest wall oscillation. Uh, but uh, well, bad habits, old habits are very hard to break. And uh, I think this is why we need to continue to educate each other about the pros and cons of high frequency chest wall isolation.